Hi, and welcome to the show. Rate and review the show at kevinemdy.com slash rate. Subscribe at kevinemdy.com slash podcast. Today in the show, we have Jeffrey Shadula. He is a pediatric psychologist. We're going to talk about his Kevin MD article, Difficulties Navigating the Healthcare System Are Causing Many Black and Brown Kids to Fall Through the Cracks. Jeffrey, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So we'll get into your article in a little bit. First off, briefly share your story and journey to where you are today. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a pediatric psychologist at Dale Children's Medical Center here in Austin, Texas. I've had experience over the past decade as an embedded or an integrated provider within pediatric primary care clinics and specialty medical clinics. And I'm currently embedded in developmental and behavioral pediatrics. Much of my career has been working in urban environments with ethnically and racially diverse and marginalized children and families. With Texas being one of four minority majority states, we see a range of diversity related to race, ethnicity language, SES, insurance status. I'm also an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at UT Austin Dell Medical School. I'm a health services researcher. And what I'm interested in is looking at health disparities and models of healthcare, particularly integrated behavioral health models that can improve access to care for marginalized children and families. So tell me some of the typical cases that you would see in a given day. That's a great question. We run the gamut. I mean, we are a developmental behavioral pediatrics clinic, so we do work with kids on the early end of the lifespan, zero to eight years old. But most of our kids have some sort of developmental disability, delay or concern, autism, ADHD. And then I'm just an in-house referral. So kids with externalizing problems, noncompliance, oppositional, disruptive behaviors, toileting, feeding, sleep, anxiety concerns, depression, mood concerns. And because we are a developmental clinic, most of the work that I do is actually training families, not working with the kids individually. Yeah. So what are some of the challenges you face when talking and interacting with the families? uptake of strategies working with parents a lot of times the first question is do we need to be there or can we just <laughs> mm. drop little johnny off on the call and you know I, I mean it's great for johnny to be there but i tell parents it's more important for you to be there because kids just react to their environment so how do we sort of set up environments in a way that's going to cultivate more of the behavior that we want and less of the be behavior that we don't want so just kind of getting parents to buy into that if i can do that then usually we're pretty good all right so let's talk about your Kevin MD article, it talks about what your passions, which is health disparities. So how did that article come about? Why did you decide to write it? It was a JAMA Pediatrics article that was published fairly recently by Dr. Salam Abdus and Thomas Selden at the AHRQ, Agency for Healthcare of Quality of Research. And when I read the article, it really just confirmed a lot of the things that I see in practice. So it did speak to me on that more clinical sense. And that's that children of color face additional barriers to accessing healthcare. And this study specifically looked at their attendance at primary care wellness visits. And it found really alarming gaps between Black and Hispanic kids compared to white kids in attending these primary care visits. And I mean, everyone listening to your podcast probably knows that these are really important appointments where children, their caregivers, they can get present preventative care, developmental services, like screening for autism. That's where they get timely immunizations. And parents really get their questions answered about their child's development. And so the AAP or the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends more frequent appointments early in the lifespan. And then after three years old, we space those out to once a year. Now in the study, 53% of black kids and 58% of Hispanic kids actually attended all of their yearly primary care wellness visits, because almost 70% of white kids. And they looked at a few other factors like insurance status. So attendance rates differed by the family's insurance status. So only 31% of uninsured families attended all of their appointments compared to 59% of those uh, families who were publicly insured and 66 for families that had private insurance. And this is, this was really important for me because we look at all the disparities that we see for kids based on race and ethnicity and SES and insurance status for uh, developmental outcomes, mental health and physical health outcomes. For example, we know that black kids are diagnosed with autism about three years later than white kids. And oftentimes we see kids being diagnosed three years later after parents had first expressed concerns about their kids' development. Sure. We know that black and brown kids have later diagnosis for things like ADHD compared to white kids. And we also know that children of color have a harder time getting their mental health needs met in primary care. And I think for the, your audience members who are wondering why we're talking about mental health care on a study that looked at primary care wellness, child visit attendance rates. We know that in the U.S., if a child is receiving mental health care, it's probably not from a psychiatrist or a psychologist. 
more than likely it's from a PCP or mm. possibly a professional in the kid's school. And so what my Kevin MD article, what focused on was looking at what are some of the reasons that these disparities in primary care attendance rates exist. Yeah. So go into that. What are some of the obstacles that can explain some of the numbers you just talked about in the study? Yeah, I think one of the things that really strikes me is a lot of the racial, ethnic, and economic disparities that we see in primary care visit attendance rates for kids really stem from factors that aren't in the kids' and families' immediate control, right? So you think about things like implicit and explicit bias and discrimination, lack of diversity in healthcare professionals, right? Sometimes that can affect the patient-provider relationships. And then just a lot of logistical barriers, right? So transportation is a big one, lack of childcare, lack of parental work leave, financial barriers, or just other social needs that complicate or take precedent in these families' lives. So now, is there a story or an example yeah. or a case study that, that you've seen in your mm-hmm. clinic that can really illustrate that point? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's usually not one thing. Sometimes it is as simple as I don't have transportation. I don't have a bus pass, cars in the shop. Usually it's a confluence of a number of events. Maybe they've had negative experiences with help seeking. Maybe they feel like their problem that we identify in primary care isn't necessarily the biggest issue that the family is dealing with, especially with, you know, the COVID pandemic and parents losing jobs and kids falling behind in, in, in school and things like that. So usually it's not just those concrete barriers. We tend to think about financial, logistics, insurance, transportation. Very often we, we think about those concrete barriers. If we can just get them to primary care, then all their you know needs will be addressed. But I think the case study that I see more often is more of those perceptual barriers. This problem really isn't that big of a problem, or it is a big mm. problem, but it's not to the top of the family's list. Or maybe they've just had negative experiences with help seeking in the past. So it's kind of addressing those perceptual barriers and those concrete or logistical barriers is more often what I see. So talk about some of the path forward, I guess. Are there any policy solutions or and are, are there any solutions from an individual practice level? Yes, yeah, so the JAMA pediatric study didn't specifically mention system navigators, so the use of non-clinician lay persons who function as healthcare workers in their article. But in highlighting the problem, where my mind went was to some of the work that many folks around the country are doing, and that's embedding system navigators onto healthcare teams to help engage families in healthcare, right? Sure. Help them so, address those concrete and those perceptual barriers. Yeah. So tell us, what is a system navigator? Yeah, for your audience who isn't familiar with what a system navigator is, sometimes they're called patient navigators, sometimes they're called family navigators, community health workers, or promotoras. And they're non-clinician lay people who partner with and engage families in their healthcare. So these are individuals who may be trusted community members. They might share a common background, whether that's race, ethnicity, language, shared cultural or lived experiences with the families that they serve. And it's really a means of providing support to address the barriers that might get in the way of someone accessing, engaging in, or maintaining their their medical care. It's also emotional support, right? Not just the, the concrete logistical support with bus passes and things like that, but it's that emotional support, you know, to help families that are dealing with real struggles. Um, And that medical appointment may not be the top priority for the family. And at the same time, for the reasons I stated earlier, we know that those primary care wellness visits are really important for early screening, detecting developmental delays, concerns, mental health problems, mental health issues. We know that many families and patients prefer to work with providers who share their race, ethnicity, or cultural background. Yet you look at the primary care physician workforce in the United States is less than 9% Hispanic, um, 5% Black, while U.S. children are 26% Hispanic and 14% Black. So really, I think it's a way to provide more cultural responsiveness within the primary care team. The problem is it's just not a model that's widely used, at least in pediatrics, more so on the adult side, though. Yeah, so I was about to ask, how, how common is that? Not very common. A colleague of mine did a systematic review a couple of years ago, and there was only eight studies of pediatric navigation models that met our, you know, that that met our criteria for, you know, quality methodology and risk of bias. System navigation really started in the 90s, the early 90s in cancer care clinics. We do see wider use today in adult 
populations. Although a lot of children's hospitals are starting to implement care navigation programs as part of their Medicaid or managed care plans for children with medical complexity, right? I mean, due just to the degree of care coordination that's involved in, in you know, all the many specialists that these families see, all the appointments and scheduling and transportation and financial barriers that come along with that. But thankfully, I think we're starting to see people around the country um, realize that more children and families could really benefit from the model. Sure. So I think for the typical community-based pediatric or family medicine practice, I think there's really a compelling argument for hiring a navigator. I think some of the research is starting to bear that out. So if you were running the show in your ideal scenario, walk us through what that ideal would look like. I think it starts with financial, the financial climate that we're in. I think that there's a sort of initial barrier to practices maybe hiring that first navigator. And I think in a perfect world, I think maybe since a lot of the costs that come from not having a navigator, higher use of the emergency department or hospital or acute care services or missed appointments, since a lot of those costs are borne by insurers, it'd be really nice if insurance companies or hospital or health systems as a whole can sort of bear out some of these upfront initial costs so that the initial decision to hire isn't necessarily borne by the primary care practice. I think that for kids, for pediatrics, there's very few studies. There are studies, but they're not all just in primary care. A lot of them are in complex care clinics within hospitals or autism clinics and things like that. There was a study out of California that was published earlier this year in the Journal of the American Board of Family Medicine that found that low-income persons of color in Los Angeles who worked with a navigator were actually three times more likely to have primary care access than those without a navigator. And they were significantly less likely to experience a lot of those barriers to care that I mentioned earlier, right? Such as not having insurance, not being able to pay for a visit, not having transportation. So it'd be really nice for those financial next steps if we could have more, more widespread navigation service and, you know, maybe insurance companies could bear some of that cost. So other than system navigation, any other solutions that we can do? There are systemic and structural reasons why families don't receive, you know, care. And I think system navigation isn't going to be the panacea, right? It can help them navigate sometimes unfair or inherently racist systems. You know, as a pediatric psychologist who's embedded in um, a subspecialty medical clinic, and I've done integrated primary care in the past, I think that's a great model. It really aligns with that high quality primary care model, that team-based model, you know, thinking about moral injury and burnout among the primary care physician workforce, dealing with behavioral health concerns, is time consuming, dealing with suicidal 16 year old adolescents isn't necessarily something that the primary care physicians are uh, necessarily trained very well in. Even if they are trained well in it, they just don't have the time. So I think embedding folks like system navigators, but then also behavioral health providers mm -hmm. to really share patient care supports families, but also the primary care physicians that they work with. We're talking to Jeffrey Shadula. He is a pediatric psychologist. His Kevin M. The article is titled, Difficulties Navigating the Healthcare System Are Causing Many Black and Brown Kids to Fall Through the Cracks. Jeffrey, what are some of your take-home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin M. The audience? Yeah, I think it's the point that I mentioned earlier is the reason the a lot of the problems that our families face in attending these primary care wellness visits are so multi-systemic. I think for primary care physicians, nurse practitioners, trying to cram into a medical visit or a well, wellness visit time to help families address some of these, these needs, it's not going to be the long-term solution. What we need to do is think about how can we build into the system, the healthcare system as a whole, these mechanisms to help improve trust and rapport and care coordination and communication and engagement over the long haul. And again, system navigation isn't the solution. It's not the panacea. Families still operate in unjust and unfair systems of care through healthcare and economic disadvantage, lack of safe and affordable house, housing, lack of access to educational opportunities. But this is a model that can help families better navigate um, those systems of care, and that can lead to better outcomes for families and children. Jeffrey, thank you so much for sharing your time and insight. Thanks again for being on the show. Thanks so much.